Yeah, then let's jump into the talk. Um, first of all, a bit of background. As Mike mentioned, I'm working both for SAP as well as being an adjunct lecturer for the University of Adelaide. Um, and this work I'm going to present here was when I was still a full-time lecturer in Adelaide um, in 2019. Um, since I assume that not all of you know where exactly Papua New Guinea is located, I want to start with a brief overview of where PNG is located and some basic statistics. So uh, PNG is located in the Pacific, close to Australia, as you can see here. Uh, the capital city is Port Moresby. Um, there are about nine million people in PNG, um, and then when you look at the GDP and the HDI, so the Human Development Index, you see that it's still a developing country. Um, and it gained independence from Australia in 1975. And at the same time, it was also from a German colony, uh, which made it quite interesting for me being German working in Australia back then when we visited Robert New Guinea. Um, we organized a workshop there in Port Moresby <clears throat> to, to study this, the challenges and opportunities for software engineering in PNG. And uh, one of my co-authors, um, he is from PNG and he agreed to um, prepare a short intro video and I'm going to show that now. Hello, my name is Rola Gaikovina Kula. I'm an assistant professor at Nara Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. So today um, I was asked to give, uh, just provide some background into why uh, we started the uh, Bridges Initiative which is which which was the first uh, international workshop on bridging the divide between uh, globally engineered software. So this workshop was um, actually it started off first. I'm I'm from Papua New Guinea and I've been fortunate enough to uh, be exposed to uh, different software engineering concepts or global software engineering uh, research and also practitioners. So I also wanted to go back to my country and see the differences or I saw some differences, but how to characterize these differences uh, was something that I was really interested in. So what I did is um, we, uh, we were able to uh, get some funding with uh, the NARA Institute of Technology, uh, Science and Technology, also with the uh, UPNG, which is the local university and different sponsors and we were able to hold the international workshop. We had uh, some participants. I was able to invite uh, uh, different experts in the field, especially in software engineering. As you know, one of them is uh, S Sebastian Valtes. So he's gonna be giving the talk. So we, we had a two day program. I won't go into all the details because I think Sebastian will give that. And these are the supporters. So we had a lot of, uh, as well as academic, we had a lot of uh, industry support from the uh, local industry. So that was the main um, motivation. And then we, we planned to do 2020 and 2021, 2022. Unfortunately, due to the Corona uh, pandemic, we were unable to continue those, but I'm hoping that this year or next year, we can uh, kickstart this pro project again and uh, I hope you, you are interested in this and maybe uh, you can come see us too as well. So uh, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so Rilo mentioned, uh, we organized this workshop. Our main question was, um, as I said in the beginning, to identify challenges of and opportunities for software engineering in PNG. And just very briefly, um, the results or the selection of results I'm going to present are based on that workshop. Uh, there were several parts, like large conference and we, we handed out surveys, did focus group interviews. Um, yeah, and that's the data we used to distill those challenges and opportunities. So first of all, there are very basic challenges, infrastructure related challenges. Um, the economy in PNG is currently dominated by the primary sector. 75% um, of the population rely on subsistence economy and the internet access is a problem. Only 30% of the population have access to internet and it's even though compared to neighboring countries such as uh, Fiji. Um, there is improvement. Um, there's um, recently there was a new sea cable installed to Australia to increase the bandwidth, but uh, also people usually don't have computers at home and they often access the internet via phones. So in summary, 
Internet is expensive, slow. It's usually used on mobile devices and there are very few flat rates. I took this picture here on the right <clears throat> while we visited uh, PNG and you see there for an actual flat rate internet connection, it would be about 250 US dollars. Um, another thing we observed is the importance of school and universities because there are computers there, there is internet access there and people go to schools and universities to access the internet and to use computers. And what we also noticed is that for quite a few people, um, the internet is specific apps such as Facebook. So then when they say they use the internet, they usually refer to specific apps. And to provide some context uh, for those internet costs, it's, it's hard to find numbers, but, but I did an estimation. So let's say the uh, lower um, threshold for middle income in PNG is uh, 325 uh, Kina, which is the local currency. And um, on the right, you see um, a picture we took back then in 2019 about how much it, it is for internet connection on a mobile device. And so for 30 gigabyte for a month, uh, you already have to pay almost half of this income, of this monthly income. And this translates to about 22 hours of Zoom calls, which is not that much if you think about how much you spend in Zoom or Teams or whatever video call software sessions every day. There's another challenge related to education and also trust. So uh, adult literacy is quite low in PNG, 63% as of 2015. And actually quite a few participants mentioned that um, improving the school and university curricula in terms of software engineering would be um, a good way to, to quickly improve the situation and the education um, in terms of software engineering in PNG. And education and trust are also related because since um, there are these problems with education and PNG in terms of software development, local the, the government and local companies don't trust local software engineers being educated in PNG and give the contracts uh, to foreign companies and workers. And this again leads to a lack of uh, local expertise in terms of software development, which could then be uh, leveraged to improve uh, the curricula at schools and universities. So that's a bit of a problem. But despite these major challenges, uh, local software engineering community, community is forming. So we visited the PNG digital ICT cluster um, and it's, it's um, small companies, startups uh, working on the domain of software development. Um, and there's also a Facebook group for ICT jobs in PNG. So there is something starting up, but it's, it's limited to the urban areas and, and mainly to the capital city of Port Moresby because the infrastructure is better there. There is, however, a huge potential for software engineering in PNG, PNG because software needs to be adapted, for example, to the local legislation in terms of the tax system, et cetera. And, um, the government and companies need software, but, but as of now, there are very few local software developers and therefore they depend on uh, foreign companies, a foreign workforce. And uh, this incurs huge costs because as we learned uh, in PNG, um, if you live in PNG as an expat developer, you are paid quite well competitive sal salaries on an international level, uh, which as I mentioned, incurs huge costs for local companies and government. So there are opportunities, first of all, for the government to invest in building a local software engineering community. And the way to start this could be focusing on customization of standard software to the local um, environment. And also in terms of development aid, the national universities can help revise the curricula at schools, at schools and universities uh, in terms of software engineering. And this was something we wanted to kickstart, but as Rula mentioned, um, due to the pandemic, it was a bit slowed down, but we hope to pick it up again now. So what can you as an individual do? Uh, first of all, if you have software that, that might be used in PNG, uh, think about customization, adaptation of your software from the beginning. Um, make sure that your software and also documentation is accessible for users with limited resources. Uh, for example, if you have auto-playing videos on your, on your landing page, um, that can incur quite a lot of cost for somebody in PNG, as I've outlined before. Provide alternatives for, for example, video tutorials in the form of written tutorials that people can access. 
And uh, consider also these limitations in case you communicate with somebody in PNG, for example, consider that a Zoom call might be quite expensive and sometimes a traditional phone call might be preferable. And just when you design your software, when you design your website, web app, um, cons consider this persona of somebody living in PNG or another developing country with limited bandwidth um, and in the internet being accessed on phones primarily and also um, on shared hardware because people have to go to schools and universities to use computers. Um, so this shared usage uh, is something to consider as well. Just, just have this persona in mind when you design your software. And that's uh, my main message for this talk. If you want to dig a bit deeper, uh, the paper is publicly available and the website of the workshop as well. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Thank you very much.